remember it because we can go, you know, um, when formations arise, consciousness comes to be. And we get this pattern of when this happens, this happens, when this happens, this happens. And I started wondering how far this goes with the way that he's teaching throughout the Majima Nikai. Now, I'm not finished yet. I mean, I just started to look into this this way. But one of the places that I noticed at first, I, I noticed if I play around with the 37 requisites of enlightenment, that's one way to, to look at it. I can't remember how were we writing on this. Bonte, do you remember how we were writing on this? Uh, you can go to share screen and uh, on the share screen, there'll be a whiteboard. You select the whiteboard. But then I need a pen or do I need a pen or a, I uh, need a... Without pen also, you'll be able to do some things. Uh, you have that pen yeah. which we had given you? Um, I have, that's, uh, I think I have the pad, that pad, but not the pen. Then I have the other pen and not the computer <laughs> because the computer has a different plug and we haven't been able to get the, the other plug yet. We've been trying to figure out how to find yeah, the other plug. Uh, and use it and maybe see if uh, you will be able to use the mouse uh, effectively. You have used uh, the mouse in the past. Is that what I did? Okay. Um, Share screen and then. Uh, let me let me let me see if I can get the mouse. Let me just try to get the mouse. If I can bring the mouse up, how do we turn the mouse on? Um, hmm. Oh, okay. First, we have to hook this to the, I think I remember, put this into, uh huh. Okay. Well, something tweeted. Oh, I think I did it. Okay, so here's a whiteboard. And what I'm trying to play with here, whoops, I, I have a needle patch on me. Um, didn't take this off. Yeah. Um, okay. First of all, you look at dependent origination and what you do is you see that there's a causal relationship that goes from each one of the And what we're saying causal relationships, why is this so interesting? Well, you know, it's interesting to me because of what's happening today with some of the writing in, in Buddhism. And, and when people are writing, um, well, let me, let me come out of here. I don't really think I need to be in here right now. And let me come back out. I think it's really interesting for us to look at this because of what's happening in some of the books that are being written about Buddhism today. And when people jump at the opportunity suddenly without enough knowledge, without enough understanding of the texts. It, and, and it has to do with spending time with the texts and reading them and getting used to reading them. You might jump and decide to do some things that maybe you shouldn't do. And I found some examples when I was in the bookstore of some newer books that are coming out where you may have heard me mention before that someone thought it would be really cool to, when they write books, and there's three words in a row, they might decide to say, instead of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, they'll do it alphabetically and they'll say Anatta, Anicca, Dukkha. So I had to stop and think about that. 
And when you do that, if you write it down on a piece of paper, um, you see, when you say Anicca, the story goes, people get upset with change. So you have, you have Anicca uh, and then you have Dukkha. Now I could go back on the whiteboard, huh? <laughs> okay, An Anicca um, and then Dukkha and then Anatta, Anatta. And when I talk about that or when Bhante Vimala Ramsey would talk about this, he would say Anicca means change and human beings don't like change. And they get upset. And what happens is dukkha arises. You see how this is working, where if you have um, change happening, this is causing you to have suffering. Then, because the suffering came up, what you he discovered, the Buddha discovered a way out of it was anatta. And to shift your viewpoint from taking things personally and all about self and shifting it to not self or impersonal nature of everything, well, all of a sudden you set yourself uh, free from the suffering. So it seems to me, and you need to check this for yourself and see how this is working. It seems to me that it's a pretty important thing to keep a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta in a line and not fool around with this. So then, I started looking at some other things and um, you have things like uh, you would have uh, the Dana Sila Bhavana. If you start changing that around, the, the Dana, let's see, the Dana was generosity, okay? And then Sila, the Sila was the, um, the precepts. And the precepts work as a protection for you. And what you do is you practice bhavana. Okay, bhavana, it means development of mind and be development of behavior patterns, okay, or changing behavior patterns. So that's the development. So let's see what happens. If we were to change that around, we would have development of uh, generosity and precepts, that's not too bad. But the point is, was the Buddha sending us a message and using this as a system of teaching by putting things in particular orders? And what I see happening is I see that a lot of people make an effort to write about how uh, the Buddha, you know, what he was teaching but they want to change it into their own format before they figure out what he was doing. In other words, we want to write a book that reflects, I can't, I don't know how to explain it, <laughs> but they want to, they want to write a book that's going to be reflecting what, what I think works before they figure out what the Buddha thought would work instead of trying to figure out what he meant if you're following what I am trying to say, <laughs> okay. And so when we start looking at what's going on, we see all kinds of things. Of course, you know, one of my favorite ones is the four step, four noble truths. And if you take the four noble truths and you say the first one is, there is suffering. And the second one is there is cause. And the third one, there is a cessation. And the fourth one is the way of a way to or a path to that cessation, to making the cessation come up longer and longer, you know, way to um, more extensive cessation. So you can learn how to let go of craving and clinging. You can understand the principle of it and you can let go of it, but can you maintain a cessation of suffering? That is what you're, you're trying to help people in daily life understand. They can manage letting go of what is happening as quickly as they can identify the arising suffering. So we look at that, we say craving, 
Here's craving and clinging is holding on to that. Okay. And then habitual tendency. Now, this is interesting habitual tendency. That's your habits of reacting. And the next one is the birth of, of those tendencies again. Birth of, uh, well, the birth of Play It Again, Sam. There's an old song called Play It Again, Sam. It comes from a musical. I don't remember which one, but it was like, play it again, Sam, play it again, play the music again. And he says, take the song and play it again and play it again. Well, here it is, you know, craving is, I like it, I want it, and falling into the attachment, which rolls into the clinging and holding on. And the clinging is making it tighter and more full of tension and tightness. And then immediately what the brain does, if you are not trying to change anything, what is the average person doing is the brain jumps into the library in their head and pulls out the card for the habitual reaction. These are tendencies, but they're reactions and they are replaying the, the reaction that you had to other things that were happening before. So now we look at how does it feel when you go through this line of craving and then clinging and then habitual tendencies, it's like tighter and tighter and tighter in the mind. And it, whatever happens in your mind happens in your body. You see, your body is following your mind. Now, this is one of wonderful thing um, that the Buddha figured out. The body follows the mind. And medical people, they know this. You've heard me say this before, because in the emergency room in the hospital, this is there all the time. And every time you can't give somebody a drug to calm the system down, you don't know how much to give them or what to do until you can connect with them, with their mind. When you have an accident victim come in, if they're unconscious, you're playing in the dark. If they are conscious, then you can get them to calm their body down. And then it helps you to be able to take them from the emergency room into the uh, operating room to start to work on repairs. This is how all of this comes together. Now let's take a look, just play with me a minute and let's go look at the 37. So the 37 are part of part of our, um, we say fundamental Buddha Dhamma foundation information. And we're trying, we were always trying to what, Bonte spent years of working on trying to capsulize and he does it naturally, he did it naturally. And he figures out a way to set up a perfect set of information for you to learn so that you can open up your practice and it moves smoother and everything comes together better. So one of the things was the Four Noble Truths. We, did we look at that when we did? Okay, we started to. There is the suffering and then there's the cause. So if we turn this around, the cause, we, we feed the cause by our personal attention. So here's this example again of Atta and Anatta. We feed the cause of the suffering with our personal attention. That's the nutriment for pushing the suffering button. And then the suffering rises up in the form of thoughts and words and actions. And the cessation of it is when we pull the plug on personal attention. We take the personal attention away from what is, the, is hurting us. And we look at it more clearly. Now we're actually looking at things in the here and now. We're looking at them in the present time. 
and we're looking at them, not, we're not taking away um, anything that's human in the process of examining this this way. We're not, we're just learning how we actually operate. It puts us in a, a position of control. We actually, if we let go of the physical kinds of control, trying to make things happen in our practice, then we begin to see that we don't have to do that, but we can become totally in control of our life because we understand how it works. Well, this just goes back to the car or to the truck that breaks down and you look under the hood and if you don't understand the engine and you don't know anything about it, how are you gonna fix it? How? So we're just playing around with this thing of, uh, can we, can things work better if we understand how things work? So he sets up the requirement of he wants you to learn knowledge as much as possible about how the mind works, the body works, and suffering works. Now, you know, we just, we had a retreat and, and you, Poulton, was there. And um, he taught about the, uh, the energy. And we were talking to some people today at the hospital about that, another person who was suffering from cancer too, and was having a lot of trouble with pain. And then I also was talking with the doctor about, you know, the issue about pain for some of us is we don't want to use pain medication, but there's a limit. <laughs> when you get to a situation like I'm in, where you have lesions and tumors that are growing inside you, and you, can, you have to you have to first of all figure out exactly how they're working and what's feeding them and can we take away what's feeding them and I slow down this whole process because the commodity right now is time. <laughs> so we have a new commodity. We were letting go it for time, letting go of time for many, many years. And now here we are, ah, the new commodity, time. So we want more time. <laughs> and it's barking at the door. <laughs> and so when you're looking at this, what's happening inside me, you, you see, you want to get as clear as possible how this is all working and whether there's a way we can turn off the drive, the hunger this cancer has for eating bone. And that's what's going on inside. So we may not be able to stop it, but we sure can slow it down. And that's what this was about today. So when you're talking about the suffering, the cause, the cessation, and the way to the cessation, that's the whole program in Buddhism. So you are suffering and you need to find out what the cause of it is. In this case, with the cancer, it took three and a half months just to diagnose it and decide what it really was. <laughs> three and a half months. Okay, now it'll take a whole month just to do a particular treatment uh, three times in a, a row for, I think it's one month, three, and then three months to be able to say, yes, this is going to stop this whole thing. So there's a lot of floating around wondering what's going to happen next. And the best thing to do with that is to put it in this little bag and then put it somewhere else <laughs> and just keep working on day-to-day -day things and doing things one at a time. So the anytime suffering comes up, you tell me what is the cause that we're showing you that's coming from the text. It is the personal opinion that goes into craving. I like this, I want this and getting attached to that. And you're not in the present time anymore. You're instead, you're pushing things around. You're not just being able to work in the here and now because you keep pushing in different directions. 
If I don't like it, I don't want it. I start pushing it away. If I like it, I want it. I start grabbing onto it and holding on. And all of this is full of tension and tightness. The cessation of it is the giving up, the relinquishing, the letting go and relaxing. Now, this relaxing thing is interesting. I think part of what's going on when we, I, I might jump around a little bit here, but we were talking the other day with somebody, I was talking to somebody and um, we were talking in terms of, um, uh, let's see, the, how it works with people today versus a long time ago, students and teachers. And the thing is, in the old days, you really trusted your teacher. When you went to a teacher to try to do something, to learn something, you had to trust your teacher and put your faith in your teacher. And then you had to try to do it the way they were showing you first. You didn't have the luxury of being able, they were very strict about this, of, of changing how they were saying it, changing the words, changing the verbiage and pushing it all around all different ways. You, you were expected to respect the teacher and try to keep it going the way it was in this case in the texts. What I'm getting at is what we have a problem, a tough time lately, we, we, we're trying to figure out how to teach better teachers with trim. And what happens is if the, if the student doesn't really have this, this built into this time period, if this is not how we're working together, they're likely to decide to change, try to change what the words are. And the vocabulary is really important when we're teaching TWIM. So when I talk to you lately, I'm gonna be talking to you from the angle of teachers, but also from the angle of students. That's because we're working with a lot of people who wanna be teaching, okay? And, and so just recently there was an, a, a discussion where, there it was in the case of a of someone teaching, but who didn't really understand what certain words were, rather than go back to the text and find out what it was or come back to us and ask us. And I don't think people realize how hard Bonte worked, and I worked with him for over 20 years. I know closer than anybody how hard he worked to say it exactly the same way over and over and over and over again. And he told me when you teach, one day when you teach, the hardest thing for you is gonna be saying it the same exact way again and again and again, until the student comes up to you and says it to you that same way. And when he's telling us this, he's, he's talking about, for instance, having something like sukha defined very clearly as Buddhist happiness and how what sukha is, for instance, and how it works and where it appears. And sukha is an interesting one to look at because it's one of the ones that's in a causal relationship. So let's look at sukha for a minute. If you write down whenever, um, whenever PT arises, PT is uplifted joy, uplifted joy, okay? Uplifting, uplifted, I'm sorry, uplifted joy. And it's different than the joy people who are not practicing with the mind. It's different than the ones that they can experience. This one is only for people who are investigating the mind and you stumble on this lightness of being uplifting feeling of mind and lightness of body and you feel really happy that's the marker for the first jhana that you, you hit the edge of the first jhana and it's a marker meaning it's a hallmark for this first jhana okay and and what's happening here is um when this joy comes up it will always fade away. So it isn't something that you can grab a hold of and keep it and hold on to it. This has got to be one of the most frustrating things for human beings on the face of the earth. 
you want, you find out you're really happy about something and then you want to hold on to that. And I can't, can't tell you how many times a student comes in the next day and says, everything's going okay today, but, but my PT is gone. I want my PT back. Where's my PT? I want my PT as if it's my PT. I should be able to hold on to it. But PT was as a result of something. P PT arose as a result of the conditions that happened, came together for PT to arise. Then when it's there, it's going to fade away. Why? Because of Anicca. We should call this the Anicca show, okay? So when it fades away, tranquility arises. This is what it tells us not in one place, but in hundreds of places again and again and again, when joy fades away, tranquility arises. When tranquility fades away, that's when sukha arises. And sukha is Buddhist happiness. And what is Buddhist happiness? We have to explain it. Buddhist happiness doesn't have this vibration type excitement in it. It is an inner contentment and it is a knowing, a knowing, like I know suddenly I understand PT for real. Suddenly I understand how tranquility comes up when it passes, has fades away. And I understand sukha is what's left. So these are adjectives. I'm trying, I was trying to figure it out this morning. These are adjectives, you know, describing conditions that exist that we pass through. Okay. It is a state. PT is a state of mind, but it's also a condition that happens for you that arises as a result of what preceded it. So if we were to change, try to change the condition, change this around and started talking about, you can make sukha arise. No, sukha is a condition that occurs when you do other things the right way. And then it, it comes up. Sukha is not palpable. You see, met, metta is, is palpable. We can say loving kindness and we smile and we put behind it and may I be happy, may my mind be free, and we feed it and we help to bring that up. It's a condition and a state too, but we can, we can work on making it stronger or less strong. But sukha is different. Sukha is the leftover knowing and that you understand piti and you understood the tranquility that followed and you understood the sukha that follows that. Now I have known other people who have just eliminated tranquility. And I, you know, this is tough. You know, if you're gonna follow the text and try to teach it from the text, you want to try to keep going with the idea that he really did experience it the way it was described. Take it, we took it as as uh, as real and we found out it really does work the way Bhikkhu Bodhi translated it. Now, there's other translations that make it a little bit more difficult to understand. And you got to kind of wade through those and figure out what's going on because there's a vocabulary that got pretty severely changed. And you have to figure out where that aligns with what you know in the, in the Bibi translation, Bhikkhu Bodhi, Venerable Bodhi's translation. So it's all a game of testing, 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 testing. So we can't change the fact that when PT fades away, tranquility comes up. And when tranquility fades away, sukha comes up. Can't change it. It's real. We can't change that craving comes before clinging and clinging comes before habitual uh, tendencies the hab habitual reactions and the birth of those reactions, we can't change that because that works that way every single time. Let's try to look at another one. So I think in the, in the, um, 
we've looked at Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. It's based, don't, don't fool around with those. <laughs> you know, because Anatta is the way out. <laughs> and, and you want to be sure that you don't, uh, you don't twist this around in a funny way. Try and find out what he figured out first. All right. Now, this tranquil wisdom insight meditation is basically whole whole thing is based on right effort. And you have the four steps of right effort enunciated again and again in, in the text. And you've got four steps going on. You have recognizing an unwholesome mind state by sensing or you know experiencing the change in tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. Yeah, that's what we're doing. So you're recognizing an unwholesome mind state and you're practicing all the time, not just in sitting in meditation, but no matter what you're doing, you're watching your mind and you wanna watch it and see if you can sense during the day when something's going on, something is tightening up. What happens if you just let go of your attention off of that unwholesome mind state and you relax your head? And those two steps right there are purifying your mind. That's a purification of the mind switching it from unwholesome to wholesome, experimenting and seeing if you can live all 24 hours in a wholesome mind state. What happens that's different for your body? What happens with the energy? What happens with the whole thing? Then you bring up the wholesome mind state to replace it. And the immediately smiling is what works the best. And we tested lots of things. We don't tell you things to try. We don't tell you to try things unless we tested them on a lot of people. We didn't just run it through one retreat and test a few people. It's different. We talked a lot in traveling. I talked a lot with Bonte about trying this, trying that, seeing what you want to do with things. And can we change it to this, change it to that? He'd say, try it, try it. When you're interviewing, try it. We would point and try this or try that. And then very few things were changed from Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. They were never really changed either. What do I mean? Well, this is my favorite friend right here. This little guy is, you can't read it. <laughs> This is an um, compact Oxford thesaurus, you see? And the thesaurus is a golden book. If you have English as a second language, this is the thing you need more than a dictionary to expand your ability to speak and write and everything. Because this one is going to tell you 10 words that mean the same thing as this word. That's what it's about. It's synonyms. And so when we took something, for instance, and said, um, changed the thing, uh, what is the thing in the first, uh, first uh, applied and sustained thought, people didn't understand it. You can watch an audience, they didn't understand applied and sustained thought, but somehow they did understand immediately if we said thinking and examining thoughts they understood right away, okay? And so that's just one example of changing it. Why did we change, for instance, did we change concentration, did we? No, we didn't really change concentration, but the most annoying thing about the word of concentration was how people from the 1950s onward lived their life in concentration and you concentrated to learn how to roller skate and you concentrated to learn how to you know ride a bike and you when you did that what happened to your body what happened to your mind and everything concentration was definitely tight and pointed 
And that's not necessarily what meditation has to be if you're trying to figure out how everything works, you see? So Bonte looked at that and said, what we have to do is get across the idea. It's a gentle collectedness of mind to work in the present time, the present time space. And that's what we're trying to get. You want to gently bring it together and you want to have an open and open observation of what's going on inside your brain, in your mind. Mind and brain, they're sort of synonymous. That's a whole story in itself. If you've ever looked at that, you, you find it gets pretty interesting because they're still looking for where mind is today. They were looking for where mind was in the time of the Buddha at the, in the same way. Brain activity we know is tied into mind. And when you're talking about something that's going on um, with your mind, you're talking about the activity of the brain at the same time. All right, let's look at the at what happens when we look at uh, causal relationships in relationship to the 37 requisites. Let's just see, four foundations of mindfulness. You have body, feeling, mind, and dhammas. So you start with your body and the body has feelings. You can't have experience feelings without a body, can you? Experiencing feelings with the body, body, feelings, mind, going into mind to make decisions about what to do about what you're experiencing. Body, feeling, mind, dhammas are the, the actual thoughts and things that are happening and popping up and going on. And they're all connected. So you see a kind of causal line in that one. The four steps of right effort, there's no question they have a causal line because you're learning to, you're exchanging unwholesome mind states for wholesome mind states, and you're developing this practice in order to purify and retrain the mind. So it's systematically organized to recognize what is distracting you, to let that go to bring up a replacement for it, and then to keep that going. It's just like a washing machine. <laughs> it's just like a washing machine. You see, you have to, the kids come in, they're covered with mud. They've been playing out there with the horses or you know, on the farm or something. They come in and you, you just can't believe that they were getting ready to go see grandma. And here they are covered with mud <laughs> to take all that stuff, the clothes off and put it in the washing machine, choose the right amount of soap, set the dial the right way, purify this clothes and re clean them and get them retrained as clean clothing and put them out for the kids again. So this is a system. It's a system of cleaning things. The five faculties. Now these are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Got it? Faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom during your meditation, which is during your life all the time. Okay. So you have faith. You put your faith in the fact that the Buddha found something. This is what we mean by faith. Put your faith in the teaching actually uncovered something and you're that's what you're destined to do here is follow the buddhist path of investigation which is the four noble truths watching the suffering watching the cause as it operates watching the cessation happen can then you're learning anicca you're picking up on anicca the dukkha and anatta as you're doing that too so these are all intertwined. They're woven together like a quilt. 
And this faith that you're going to have enough energy to sit down and observe with mindfulness and your concentration in a balanced way. And you're going to come up with a set of wisdom. And the wisdom you come up with is how does everything work and how can I change it to make it systematically work better? That's what you're doing. Okay. Then you have five powers. Now, the, um, okay, wait a minute, I'm sorry. You have five, four, four bases of spiritual power. I used to hate this one because I could never remember how to, how to remember it. One pays attention to how your spiritual power develops. And your spiritual power is, um, it's your ability to uncover all of this and learn it and put it into use and make it practical. The develop it to a pragmatic point so it's functional, okay? And so what you're doing is you pay attention to how um, you your spiritual power develops, which consists of, of, of consists of productive concentration that is due to enthusiasm and due to energy and due to purity of mind and due to investigation. So you have to keep your enthusiasm going. When you start investigating this, you don't just do it for a little while and give it up and walk away. You gotta take it out in life. You have to play with it. I'm having fun here because these guys that I work with here and the work that they do in counseling people and helping them to communicate better and interact with people in, uh, in life, in interactions and in relationships, in jobs, in, in, in uh, uh, developing their business and developing anything they're working with, right? And when they are doing that, they need to have enthusiasm in what they're doing, keep their energy up, and constantly be purifying their mind through using the six R's so that they're right on task. And these guys counsel two or three people a day. Each sitting for them is 90 minutes long on counseling by phone with these programs they're teaching. And you're in, they're investigating constantly how to cue the person in to where they need to work on, what they need to work on, focus on perfectly, but they have to figure it out themselves. So they're leading the person to the answer and TWIM is helping them. And we've been using TWIM now for about three and a half months on this level with these clients in four or five different countries. And the difference is significant because they see how you can cleanse the mind and bring it into the present time very quickly. So their focus improves, the person's focus improves. They are able to see very quickly where their own suffering is and the cause of it and the cessation of it and how to practice the cessation again and again and again and again. And some of them even have this happening automatically now, whoopee. <laughs> And it's only been like two, three months. Okay. So I know it's real. It's not hypothetical. It's not a theory. Siddhartha really did find something that really, really, really works well. Then the five powers come. The five faculties of five powers are the same thing. But the five faculties, when you look at them, those five faculties are happening now automatically. That's all it means. It's the only reason they've called powers. Seven factors of awakening has to do with seven pieces that work together to guide you through the deepest levels, nothingness, base of nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. That's like your seventh and your eighth jhanas before you fall into cessation what happens when you fall into cessation what happens you reboot your brain you're rebooting the computer 
your brain is the closest thing we have to a computer for this body, the human body. To reboot that brain means to restart it and turn it back to the um, to this to the uh, oh what am I trying to say? Reboot it <laughs> means to turn it back to the place where you started with the brand new computer. So it's like stop, stop all the past concern future concern, wipe it away. Now you've got this to work with. Right away, you're so much lighter than you were before, so much lighter. And now when you're working, you're seeing clearly how everything is operating. And then you take this and you apply this to kids in school. I used to help kids in school a lot more than I get to now. But the thing that made the difference for people about school, especially in high school level, was they have a job now. Their parents go out and have jobs, but they have a job now. And it's to prepare for the job they're going to have later in life. And what all the dreams, all the things they want, all the things they think about, they'd really desire or like to have acquisitions in life, whatever. This is the time for them to prepare for that. And when they learn how uh, the dependent origination works from the point of contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual reactions, and the birth of those reactions, when they learn about that, they are on the inside track. They're more powerful than anybody else. They start to see how things are actually working in life and they're focused, they get interested in more. I want to know what else he did. What else did this Buddha do? What did he find? He found a way to a pure mind, working better than an impure mind or wholesome life, being more rewarding than an unwholesome life. And he figured out a way for this concentration to develop naturally. And he did it by, by doing this again and again, this um, sort of causal type of relationship. Now, I want, I want to show you one thing. If you go in your Majima Nikaya, number 24, if you have the Majima Nikaya, get your book out and go to 24. And in 24, you're going to find a sutta that's called a chariot, the chariots, the one about the chariots. And the chariots... Sutta is interesting because it has set up a causal relationship to remember how to make everything work with what the Buddha taught. And this is an example of how he he does this. You know, he does this all the time. You know, he took he took virtue. And listen, listen to the front part of this so you begin to understand. Here's how it begins. The relay chariots. It's called the relay chariots. The Ratha Vinita Sutta. Majima Nikaya number 24. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living in Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary. Now, Bhante used to say to me all the time, he couldn't understand why they wanted to live in a squirrel's sanctuary. <laughs> you know, who wants to live in a squirrel sanctuary? Yes, 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 all the time, <laughs> you know, but that's where they decided to set up camp. And I think because this nice energy of these monks was there, maybe the squirrels were a little bit more quiet. <laughs> and then a number of monks that came from the Blessed One's native land, and they had spent the rains retreat there in the Sakin country. And they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side, and the Blessed One asked them, who in my native land is esteemed by the bhikkhus there, by his companions in the holy life, in this way, having few wishes himself, 
He talks to the bhikkhus on contentments, secluded himself. This is the second one, secluded himself. He talks to the bhikkhus on aloofness from society, staying away from society to find the simpler operation of everything first, then go back in society and everything gets easier. Energetic himself, he talks to the bhikkhus about arousing their energy, keeping up the energy that you need for your practice. He attained to virtue himself. He talks to the monks on the attainment of virtue. So he's using virtue here. Then attained to concentration himself. He talks to the monks on the attainment of concentration. And this is about your ability to collect the mind for your observation in mindfulness. He talks to the monks on the attainment of concentration, explaining it specifically, and then attains to wisdom himself. He talks to the monks on the attainment of wisdom and explains how the wisdom operates. He attained to deliverance himself. He talks to the monks on the attainment of deliverance, how to go through to reset the mind, to reboot the mind. Attained to the knowledge and vision of deliverance himself. He talks to the uh, monks on the attainment of the knowledge and vision of deliverance. So. This is this knowledge and vision approach to learning is knowing something by seeing it for yourself, also called direct knowledge. Practice of direct knowledge is pursuing the knowledge and vision deliverance. He is one who advises, informs, instructs, urges, rouses, and gladdens his companions in the holy life. Venerable Sir, the Venerable Puna Mantaniputta is so esteemed in the Blessed One's native land by the bhikkhus there, by his companions in the holy life. And on that occasion, the Venerable Sariputta was seated near the Blessed One. And then it occurred to the Venerable Sariputta, it is a gain for the Venerable Puna Mantana Putta. It is a great gain for him that his wise companions in the holy life praise him point by point in the teacher's presence. Perhaps sometime or other we will meet this venerable Puna, Mantana Putta, and, and we will have some conversation with him. And then when the Blessed One had stayed in Rajagaha as long as he chose to, he set out to wander by stages to Sawati. And wandering by stages, he eventually arrived at Sawati. And there he lived in Jetis Grove and not the Pindicus Park. The Venerable Puna heard about this and the Blessed One has arri arrived at Sa Sawati and is living in Jetis Grove in Athapindicus Park. And then the Venerable Puna, he set his rest out of his uh, resting place in order and taking his outer robe and bowl, he set out to wander by stages to Sawati and wandering by stages, he eventually arrived at Sawati and he went to Jetis Grove not the Pindicus Park. And to see, he went there to see the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, the Blessed One sat down on one side and urged and roused and gladdened him with talk on the Dhamma. He urged and roused and gladdened by the Blessed One's talk. He was delighting and rejoicing in his words from his seat. And after he paid homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he went to the blind man's grove for a day's abiding. Then a certain monk, he went to the venerable Sariputta and said to him, friend Sariputta, the bhikkhu Puna Mantana Puta, 
of whom you have always spoken highly has just been instructed, urged and roused and gladdened by, gladdened by the blessed one with a talk on the Dhamma. But after delighting and rejoicing in the blessed one's words, he rose from his seat and after paying homage to the blessed one, keeping him on his right, he has gone to the blind man's grove for the day's abiding. Then the venerable Sariputra hurriedly took his sitting cloth and he followed close behind the venerable Puna Mantanaputta and keeping his head in sight just so he could see him. And then the venerable Puna, he entered the blind man's grove and sat down in a day's abiding at the root of a tree. The venerable Sariputta entered the blind man's grove and sat down for the day's abiding at the root of a tree. And then when it, it was at evening time, Sariputta rose from his meditation and went to the venerable Puna, exchanged greetings with him. And when his courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down on one side and he said to the venerable Puna Mantanaputta, is the holy life lived under our blessed one, friend? Yes, friend. But friend, is it for the sake of purification of virtue that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Now you got to write each one of these down so you can follow them close. Then it was for the sake of purification of mind that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of purification of view that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of purification by overcoming doubt that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of the purification of knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Well, then is it this for the sake of purification by knowledge and vision of the way that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Is it for the sake of the purification of knowledge and vision that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Friend, when asked, but friend, is it for the sake of purification of virtue that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? You replied, no, friend. And when you were asked the other questions, then it was for the sake of purification of mind or purification of view or purification of overcoming doubt or purification by knowledge and vision of what is path and what is not path or purification by knowledge and vision of the way, or purification by knowledge and vision that the holy life is lived under the blessed one, you replied, no, friend, in each case. And for the sake of what then, friend, is this holy life lived under the blessed one? Friend, it is for the sake of final Nibbana. Without craving and clinging that the holy life is lived under the blessed one. But friend, is purification of virtue final Nibbana without clinging? No, friend. Is purification of mind final Nibbana without clinging? No, friend. Then is purification of view final Nibbana without clinging? No, friend. And is purification by overcoming doubt final Nibbana without clinging? No, friend. Is this purification by knowledge and vision of 
what is a path and what is not the path, final Nibbana without clinging? No, friend. Then is purification by knowledge and vision of the way final Nibbana without clinging? No, friend. Well, is the purification by knowledge and vision final Nibbana without craving and clinging? No, friend. But friend is Nibbana without craving and clinging to be obtain, attained without these states. No, friend. It's quite a conversation after going through all those things. And then he says, you do have to have them, but that's not what this is for. And he finally comes out and says, no, friend. When asked, but friend, is purification of virtue final nibbana without craving and clinging? You replied, no, friend. And when you are asked on the purification of mind, purification of view, purification of overcoming doubt, purification of knowledge and vision of what is path and what is not path, and purification by knowledge and vision of the way, and purification and knowledge and vision, final nibbana without craving and clinging, you replied, no, friend. And when asked, but friend is final Nibbana without craving and clinging to be obtained without these states. Yet you replied, no friend, but how friend should the meaning of these statements be regarded? Well, I'm glad that I'm not the only one that's confused because they were confused too. Let's see what happens now. How does he explain this? How does he explain it in a way they're going to remember it? Friend, if the Blessed One had described purification of virtue as final Nibbana without craving and clinging, he would have described what is still accompanied by craving and clinging as final Nibbana without clinging. And if the Blessed One had described the purification of mind, view, overcoming doubt, purification of knowledge and vision of what is path and not path, the purification by knowledge and vision of the way, purification by knowledge and vision as final Nibbana without clinging, he would have described what is still accompanied by craving and clinging as final Nibbana without clinging. And if final Nibbana without craving and clinging were to be obtained, without these states, then an ordinary person would have attained final Nibbana, for an ordinary person is without these states. Hmm. So as to that, friend, I shall give you a simile. Now comes the fun. For some wise men understand the meaning of this whole statement by means of a simile. Suppose that uh, King Pasanadi of Kosala, while living at Sawati, had some urgent business to settle at Sakita, and that between Sawati and Sakita, seven relay chariots were kept ready for him. Then the King Pasanadi of Kosala leaving Sawati through the inner palace door would mount the first relay chariot. By means of the first relay chariot, he would arrive at the second relay chariot, and then he would dismount from the first chariot and mount up on the second chariot. By means of the second chariot, he would arrive at the third chariot. And by means of the third chariot, he would arrive at the fourth. By means of the fourth chariot, he would arrive at the fifth. And by means of the fifth chariot, he would arrive at the sixth chariot. By means of the sixth chariot, he would arrive at the seventh chariot. By means of the seventh chariot, he would arrive at the inner palace door at Sakata. Then when he had come to the inner palace door, 
his friends and acquaintances and his kinsmen and relatives would ask him, Sire, did you come from Sawati to the inner palace door in Sakata by means of this relay chariot? How then should King Pasanadi of Kasala answer in order to answer correctly? In order to answer correctly, friend, he should answer thus. Here, while living at Sawati, I had some urgent business to settle in Sakata. Between Sawati and Sakata, seven relay chariots were kept ready for me. And leaving Sawati through the inner palace door, I mounted the first relay chariot. By means of the first relay chariot, I arrived at the second relay chariot, dismounted from the first chariot and mounted on the second. And by means of the second chariot, I arrived at the third, the third to the fourth, the fourth to the fifth, the fifth to the sixth, the sixth to the seventh. And by means of the seventh chariot, I arrived at the inner palace door in Sakata. In order to answer correctly, he should answer in that way. <laughs> and so too, friend purification of virtue. Now, here's what he's trying to show you. Purification of virtue is for the sake of reaching purification of mind. And purification of mind is for the sake of reaching purification of view. And purification of view is for the sake of reaching purification of overcoming doubt. And purification of overcoming doubt is for the sake of reaching purification of knowledge and vision of what is path and what is not the path. Purification by knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path is for the sake of reaching purification by knowledge and vision of the way. Purification by knowledge and vision of the way is for the sake of reaching purification by knowledge and vision. Purification by knowledge and vision is for the sake of reaching the final Nibbana without craving and clinging. And it is for the sake of final Nibbana without clinging that the holy life is lived under the blessed one. When this was said, the venerable Sariputta asked the venerable Puna, what is the venerable one's name? How do his companions in the holy life know this venerable one? Why, my name is Puna, friend, and my companions in the holy life, they know me as Matanaputta. It is wonderful, friend. It is marvelous. Each profound question has been answered point by point by the Venerable Puna to a learned disciple who understands the teacher's dispensation correctly. It's a gain for his companions in the holy life and a great gain for them. They have the opportunity to see and honor the Venerable Puna, Mantana Puta. Even if it were by carrying the Venerable Puna, Mantana Puta, about on a cushion on their heads, that his companions in the holy life would get the opportunity just to see and honor him, it would be a gain for them and a great gain for them. And is a gain for all of us, great gain for us that we have this opportunity to see and honor Mantana Puta. And when this was said, the Venerable Puna Mantana Puta, he asked the Venerable Sariputta, what is the Venerable One's name? And how do his companions in the holy life know the venerable one? So he's now asking Sariputta what his name is. He doesn't realize that Sariputta is the one who has been listening to him all this time. My name is Upatisa, friends, and my companions in the holy life, they know me as Sariputta. Indeed, friend. We did not know that we were talking with the Venerable Sariputta, the disciple who is the teacher himself. And if we had known that this was the Venerable Sariputta, we should have said not, not have said so much. 
It is wonderful, friend. It is marvelous because each profound question has been posed point by point by the Venerable Sariputta as the learned disciple who understands the teacher's dispensation correctly. And it is a gain for his companions in the holy life and a great gain for them that they have the opportunity to see and honor the Venerable Sariputta. Even if it were by carrying the Venerable Sariputta about on a cushion on their heads, that his companions in the holy life would get the opportunity to see and honor him, it would be a great gain for them, a great gain. And it is a gain for us too, a great gain for us that we have the opportunity to see and honor Venerable Sariputta. And thus it was that these two great beings rejoiced in each other's good words and met each other with questions and answers. So here you have this profound line of chariots and they try to show you how each one of these pieces that you're learning virtue for the sake of developing the mind and you're learning about the mind for the sake of the purification of you and you're learning the purification of view for the sake of removing doubt. And he's showing you his causal relationship. You see, causal, 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 right down. And the knowledge and vision of what is path and what is not path comes upon you when doubt leaves. And you begin to see it everywhere. And by knowledge and vision of the way, that's why you learned knowledge and vision of what path is and what path is not, you will stay on the way. You will start to work the way in your life all the time. And then you're practicing the way for the sake of knowledge and vision that the holy life is lived under the blessed one for these reasons. And so it isn't just one tiny piece it's the unfolding of the causal links and relationships in all these different groups. And this is repeatedly done in the text showing you how you are able to learn the Dhamma clearly. So let's throw it open for questions. We have about 10 minutes here or so, and we can, anybody have any questions about this? How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Uh, I, I have I have a question and a and, and a query. Um, what I liked about the relay of chariots, chariots was that you don't carry the past chariot on with you, and um, so there it's a support that moves you on. But it's also important, for instance. Um, uh, in a purification of um, uh, of view or, or, or whatever, it's, it's embedded in the next stage. It's not something that you then dispense with. It's it's embedded in the next stage. Um, uh huh. But but you don't carry the experience that that created with you. So you were talking earlier about the attachment to the loving kindness or the pity, and and right. that dis and that disappears. And the disappearing is an important step, is important recognition, and the relationship to the disappearing is an important recognition. That's right. And on the retreat, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, a, another definition of attainments, and seeing this relay of chariots and understanding these causal links is another of the attainments. That's right. That's why that's why we have a misconception right now on what attainments actually are. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that D Bhante Damagavesi and I have discussed a number of times that the real attainment that is occurring in our uh, retreats are the improvement of the different layers of training for the person as they go through each retreat. And their their uh, in their improvement in time, their improvement in observation, their improvement in translation of what they're seeing, and and having they're beginning to discover how these are all um, set up 
in a causal relationship. The whole teaching is a causal relationship. It's remarkable. And you know, this thing about um, what you just said about um, as it moves on, the, the one example that Karuna Dasa used in trying to explain this in his book, this is Professor Karuna Dasa from Hong Kong University. I like, I like his books. And um, he said that if you take a staircase and you go down to the bottom of the staircase, in order for you to get to the second stair, you had to step on the first stair to get to the second stair. And then from getting to the second stair to the third stair, you had to step on the second stair to get to the third stair. Now they're not part of the, of the next stair. If you, if you draw this, this staircase in front of you on a piece of paper, you, you just, and you let this sink in, it's kind of remarkable because you have to stand on the first stair to get to the second stair. Okay, uh, but when you're on the second stair, the first stair isn't part of it, but it was the causal existence of it. You see, so this is, this is how he was trying to get you to understand. It's no longer a part of where you are, but and yet it was part of what you had to know in order to get there. And he, and the, the Buddha had perfected that inside the, uh, causal relationships of setting everything up in the different groups and stuff and also in in the uh dependent origination too yeah I, and it also it seems to me that although these are causal links um there's aspects of them that do need to be maintained within the practice um so one one example perhaps would be sila uh, Sila is a, a, a causal link for developing uh, the first jhana. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you can't then sort of go through to a certain stage and then assume that Sila is, is of no consequence anymore. That's uh, right. It's important. Yeah. Uh, mm. No, that's really important. And that's one of the things that Bhante Vimal um, Ramsey used to talk a lot about is people say, well, we already know the sila, so we'll just put that aside and then we'll try to go, but then they never get there. You see, that's one of the reasons that the kind of progress that we see happening, it doesn't happen all the time because they they took um, the idea, the, the, the description, I forget how it works with the, um, with the, uh, oh, how does it work? With the eight parts of the Eightfold Path, but you have the seal of parts, and then you have uh, the practical parts that you're going to work with, and and then you have the um, wisdom, the wisdom outcome. Okay, you cannot, uh, you were not supposed to take that, those three pieces for sila, and dismiss them after you learned what they were. You were supposed to keep them going all the time. And I have used the example of this by taking a. Um, you know, you take a piece of paper, I, I, you've probably seen me do this. You take a piece of paper, like take this piece of paper, all right, and you fold it in half, okay? And um, then you fold it in half again, okay? And then you fold it in half one more time. Now, when I open this up, I'm going to have an eight-fold fan. And this is something this old teacher in Sri Lanka, he showed me this. The first, he's the, actually, it wasn't something I thought of. It was actually when he made it perfectly clear. He said, you know, once you do this, you have these pieces. Okay, here, I'm going to open them up and then I'm going to, I'm going to refold them so that they, they come out like a fan. You have to do it back again like this. And you have to like this and he was saying that in modern teaching a lot of times people think that you can just uh he said here's eight okay he starts like this eight folds right so if i open this up like this i have a fan that can cool me and he would say now i have a fan that i can cool myself i can feel it right but if i were to take three of these and eliminate them okay so let's take three of them and eliminate it. 
And now my fan is getting smaller. <laughs> and now I can't, I can't, I can't get almost any coolness out of this. And I'm irritated and upset. And <laughs> he says, I'm craving for coolness and I, I don't have any way of doing it. And then if you eliminate more pieces, <laughs> you know, than that, and you end up just having three practice pieces left. You only have three practice pieces left now. You can't, you can't make any air. He was just being funny, but he was trying to get across. The fact that you cannot take these things and eliminate them out, that the eightfold path was eight folds in a path for a reason. You have to be using all eight of them in the correct way for you to make progress the way the Buddha was intending. That's what he was trying to show you. And I, I thought that's such a simple example, you know, to take a piece of paper and show the kids that in Sunday school. And they began to understand Sila is like a, a, a backbone. It has to be there and has to be functional and developed and continue to be developed or else the progress doesn't happen. Yeah. So anybody got anything else here? Huh? Happy to see some people. Hello, I see Dr. Madison, hello. And I see Roy Shetty, hello. Okay, so good to see you. Great, good to see you. Okay. So I'm gonna take some rest now because I, I walked in the, uh, the moment that I got back um, from doing testing at the hospital again. It's my new occupation, <laughs> testing at the hospital. Okay, so, and... Um, I will let you all go until we get, we meet again. And so let's say our prayer, okay? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay.